The New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, NJCTS, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, or objectivity or usefulness of the information presented on our site. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate for any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now I'm going to turn over the introduction of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the program coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Thanks, Kelly, and good evening, everyone, and welcome. Before I introduce tonight's presenter, I'd like to call your attention to the slide on your screen that's promoting our April 14th walk at Ramapo College in New Jersey. For those of you who live in or are neighboring New Jersey, I hope you'll join us for a walk to promote TS awareness. Additionally, if you tuned in late and missed the big opening slides, I want to remind everyone about a couple of things that all have a May 1st deadline. Scholarship applications for graduating high school seniors who are New Jersey residents and are going on to either college or trade school. Also, you can nominate your child's teacher as educator of the year and your child's doctor as medical professional of the year if you think they have made a difference in the life of your child with TS. Last but not least, registrations for our family retreat weekend, Camp Bernie 2013, are due on May 10th. Information and registration for all of these events are on our website. Now, thanks for your patience. It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter for tonight, Stephanie Goodman. Stephanie is a certified nutritional counselor and holistic health practitioner. She received her undergraduate degree from Indiana University and her certification in clinical nutrition from the Academy of Natural Health. Stephanie became interested in helping others live a healthy lifestyle when years ago she was able to treat her own health challenge by changing her diet. She's passionate about giving parents the tools they need to help them make the right choices for their kids by providing a nourishing and healthy lifestyle. As a parent of two young boys, Stephanie is aware of the challenges facing parents today. Busy schedules, temptations of fast food and processed food, it's often difficult, although not impossible, to pull together a quick, healthy meal. Stephanie is the founder of Progressive Nutrition Solutions, a nutritional counseling practice located in the Princeton, New Jersey area that guides families to achieve optimum nutrition. She specializes in nutrition for children with issues such as autism, ADHD, and gastrointestinal disorders, all of which can benefit by incorporating healthy diets and lifestyles. Stephanie, welcome. We're delighted to have you join our webinar family. And without further introduction, I'll turn the presentation over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kelly and Marty and the NJCTS. I'm really excited to be here. Um, obviously, I think nutrition is an extremely important topic, particularly for children who have issues. Um, so let's get started. So um, just to give you a little bit more background about myself, um, I grew up in a relatively uh, health conscious health conscious family. Um, my mother always cooked dinner, and my father was um, actually a fitness nut. He uh, ran marathons, and um, a lot of times we would learn uh, the newest, the latest nutrition information from Runner's World. So uh, we uh, had heard a lot of information growing up. And, um, but as I got older, when I was in about my 20s, I started to have some health issues. Uh, more, I was having digestive issues, and I went to doctor after doctor after doctor and had so many tests done. And finally, in the end, I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. And um, all that they did was basically give me a prescription and say, well, there's not much you can do, but here, you can take this when it's bothering you, and maybe it will help. So I really wasn't happy with this, so that, so I kept looking, and I fortunately found a uh, doctor who practiced more alternative-type medicine. He was really the first person 
who asked me what I was eating, and I really changed my diet around. And um, a big part of that was taking gluten out of my diet, and it was really life-changing for me. So I started digging deeper, and I became really passionate about it. And actually, that's when I decided to go back to school, and I became a nutritionist. Stephanie, could you speak up just a little? Sure. Is this better? I know that we have a static, a little static here. Um, I'll, I'll, they, they, I was just getting questions from the audience, so just speak as loud as you, you can. Okay. Well, hopefully people can type in and let you know if this is better. Okay. I'll just try to keep my uh, uh, voice closer to the phone. Um, so I am very passionate about teaching uh, all the things that I've learned about uh, nutrition, and uh, so that's when, why I'm glad to be here today. So let's take a look at uh, the children today. You know, we're living with much busier lifestyles than we had 30 years ago. Um, you know, we're running to so many different appointments. Technology has made us big, busier. Uh, there's more quick foods available. A lot of the parents, myself included, did not learn that much about cooking growing up. Uh, so a lot of them are not comfortable in the kitchen. and. Uh, not only are they not comfortable, we just don't have as much time to prepare food in the kitchen. And uh, in addition, the food sources that we have are less nutritious. So what are people eating today, particularly the standard American diet? People are eating things that have a lot of starches, cereal, bread, pro uh, processed meat, and foods with a lot of additives. Uh, the diet, which the trend started probably in the 80s or 90s, a lot of our diets now are low in healthy fat, which is not a good thing, and I'll be talking about that more later. We're drinking a lot of soda and getting a lot of sugar, and as I said before, we're, a lot of times we're eating on the run because fast foods are just so much more available. And I love this quote by Jeff Arter. It says, we live in an age when pizza gets to your home before the police, which is just so true. So how is the standard American diet affecting us? Well, back in the early 1900s, the United States ranked number one in health. And now we're ranked 42nd. And that's a pretty big drop. There's been an increase in all types of diseases. Um, C. Everett Koop, who's probably the most popular surgeon general, um, he actually just passed away a few days ago at the age of 96. But back in 1988, he said that Americans are not starving from lack of food, but malnourished from not eating proper food. And um, some other information, as I said, low-fat diets are not really the best thing. And um, there's some information about margarine, which is also not a great, great thing to eat. And how is the standard American diet affecting children? Well, you hear so much about obesity. It's really increased over the years. Uh, there's a higher incidence of type 2 diabetes, which is the more common type of diabetes. And many children actually have it and are not being diagnosed because um, they're not being tested for it. Back in uh, a few years ago, they did a pretty large study in Australia, and they compared kids eating a healthy diet with those that were eating more like the standard American type diet. And they found that those eating the more standard American type diet were actually two, more than two times as likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. So we know that there's definitely a connection between nutrition and behavior. Back in the early 1920s, there was a dentist. His name is Dr. Weston Price. And he decided that he wanted to study how nutrition affected dental health. So he went around and traveled the world, and he looked at different civilizations to see how, what they were eating and how their teeth looked. And he found several isolated civilizations. And particularly, there was one area in Switzerland that didn't even have a dentist. They were very isolated, and they basically lived off the land and grew their own food and meat. And he found that two out of three of them had perfect teeth. 
And he kept looking, and he realized that not only did they find they had less um, tooth decay when they were eating these more healthier nutritional-type diets, but also when they were eating healthier, they had less diseases. So he really, he really is the one that found that uh, nutrient-dense foods are the key to health. There's a great book by a woman named Sally Fallon, and it's called Nourishing Traditions. And she talks more about the work that he did, and she gives recipes and talks about bringing more traditional type foods into the diet. And basically, if you take a look at what your great-grandparents were eating, those were really more the type of foods that um, tend to be healthier. So as I said before, some of the problems with the modern diet is the amount of processed foods that people are eating. What happens is when they process this food, they're actually removing nutrients. And um, while technology has been great in so many areas, it's actually not been so great for nutrition because it's really allowed us to break down food and make it less natural. And on top of that, the way that we are farming these days, as compared to 100 or 200 years ago, has really affected the conditions of the soil. Now, looking back, years and years ago, all farming used to be organic. But now, things need to be certified to be called organic. And I'm not going to go too much into it, but you know, we started using fertilizers. If you look back at uh, the early 1900s, we were using about 3.7 million tons of fertilizers. But after World War II, uh, they had a huge surplus of something called ammonium nitrate. And um, they didn't know what to do with it, but they realized that it would work great as a fertilizer. So many of the weapons plants were converted to fertilizer plants. And then by 1989, that 3.7 million tons became 47 million tons. And the same thing goes with pesticides. Before World War II, we weren't using as many pesticides. But after World War II, um, the, the number of pesticides we were, were using has increased incredibly by a huge amount. And pesticides, have, there's been studies that link pesticides to ADHD and many other health issues. And as I said before, the soil is not as healthy as it used to be. In fact, over the last 100 years, they found that the mineral levels in soil has decreased by maybe uh, about 85% in North America. And this is due to using more fertilizers and pesticides and just the, the way that they change the way they're farming. Now, Dr. Linus Pauling, a lot of people have heard of him. He's done a lot of uh, work with, um, he did a lot of work with vitamin C therapies. Uh, he's a two-time Nobel Prize winner. And he said that you can actually trace every sickness, every disease, and every ailment to a mineral deficiency. So if you think about it, we're not getting as much minerals in the food that we're eating. And we are seeing an increase in health issues. And there's a book written by Andre Voisin. He is a biochemist. Uh, he wrote a book called Soil, Grass, and Cancer. And he found that the uh, how the problems with soil has really linked to health issues. So what can we do? Uh, there's an author. His name's Michael Pollan. And he's really an author and a food advocate. And I recommend any book that he's read. He's written several of them. But in one of his books, he says when people ask them what can they do, he tells them to eat food, real food. So you want to avoid these processed foods. One of the best things I can tell parents to do is to bring your kids into the kitchen when you're cooking. Teach them how to cook. I really strongly believe it's such a life skill for kids to know how to cook. And not only that, when kids are in the kitchen cooking, they're so much more willing to taste new foods, and it gives them a sense of pride. So it's just a great thing for them to be in the kitchen with you. One thing I'd like to tell parents to do is try experimenting with new fruits and vegetables. You can make it like a game, have the fruit of the month or the vegetable of the month and, and try something that you never know what the uh, kids are going to like eating. Definitely keep soda out of your house. There's so many ingredients in soda that's not healthy, and uh, you just want to make it less available as much as possible. 
Now, when you're buying foods at the store, you can't rely on what it says. If you're buying something from a box, you can't rely on what the box says. So if it says no fat, sugar-free, or light, that just doesn't mean anything to me. I don't even know what L-I-T-E means. I don't know the definition of that. So I always tell people, put that back, because a lot of times if they're taking something out, like the fat or the sugar, they're putting something else in. What you really want to do is turn the box or the package around and get used to reading labels. You want to read the ingredients that they're putting into the food. And you want to avoid things such as partially hydrogenated oil. You, you're probably hearing a lot more about it now, which is great. Um, some people hear it being called trans fat. And what it is, it's actually uh, they take an unsaturated fat and they zap hydrogen into it, and it becomes a saturated fat. Now, normal fat takes about 18 days to break down half of it in the body. But these trans fats take 51 days to break down half of it. And something really important is around each of our cells is a cell membrane. And we want those cell membranes to be as healthy as possible because that's where nutrients get into the cells, and that's how waste gets out of the cells. And what happens is when you eat these trans fats, they actually block those membranes from working as well as they should. You, you see these trans fats a lot of times in uh, crackers and cookies. They are starting to take it out of the food, which is great. But uh, unfortunately, you can look at the front of the package, and something can say it has zero trans fat. And when you look at the ingredients, if it has half a gram or less, they are allowed to round it down. So that's another reason you want to get used to reading the ingredients. These trans fats have been linked to heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, all kinds of health issues. So definitely avoid that one. Another thing you want to avoid is high fructose corn syrup. I really think there's a, a strong links with this high fructose corn syrup and the obesity crisis. They started putting this into foods in the early 1980s, and that's really about the same time that the obesity crisis started. It's actually made from a really expensive process. It costs a lot less than sugar does, but it's actually six times sweeter than sugar. So the food companies love it because people want to eat this. It tastes good. And uh, the body just does not know how to process this food. So it causes problems with metabolism and liver. Uh, it, it's also uh, now being called corn sugar. So you want to watch for that ingredient as well. And it's in a lot of foods that uh, you might think are healthy, but uh, you definitely want to check the ingredients for that one as well. Um, I know one of the things, a lot of people think Gatorade is healthy, but uh, there's a lot of bad ingredients in Gatorade, and high fructose corn syrup is one of them. Other food additives are preservatives and um, artificial colorings and flavorings. Research has really shown that removing them helps children to be less hyperactive. Like, less hyperactive. Actually, one health expert put an entire school on a preservative-free diet and an additive-free diet, and within days, the teachers noticed a difference, and the children even noticed improvement. So I wish all the schools would do that. I would love to help any schools that want to do that. <laughs> um, some examples of these preservatives are uh, letters that don't really sound like food, um, and the letter and number combinations, like yellow number five, uh, F, D, and C, and a color. Uh, so you really want to stay away from that one. Uh, another food additive is nitrates. And that's put in a lot of times in lunch meats. Uh, it's a preservative. It's been linked to uh, cancer. An interesting story is when I was younger, I used to uh, go to a different school one day a week. So I would bring my lunch with me. And every week, I would bring a bologna sandwich. And coincidentally, at that, it was on Wednesdays, I remember. And I would get migraine headaches every Wednesday. 
And a friend of my mother's actually said, you know, there might be a problem with those nitrates that might be causing her headaches. So when I stopped eating that bologna, my headaches went away. So that's a clear link to a problem with food and a health issue. Another additive is sodium benzoate, which can also be linked to cancer and may cause hyperactivity. What's interesting about the sodium benzoate, it's in a lot of, a lot of different ingredients one of which I see a lot of it in salad dressing. And they found that when the sodium benzoate combines with things like vitamin C or E, it gets even more dangerous. So if you're putting this uh, sodium benzoate on a salad, you're combining it with these vitamins. So it's definitely not a good thing. And another place I'm seeing these additives is a lot of children's multivitamins. Um, my feeling on that is I would much rather see a children not take one of those multivitamins than take one with the additives and the colorings and the flavorings. But there are plenty of children's multivitamins that do not have those colorings and flavorings in it. For more information, a great resource is the Feingold.org. And this organization was started by Dr. Feingold years ago, and he found really that there was a link between all these additives and uh, children with learning issues and hyperactivity. So check out that website. It gives you a lot of great information there. MSG, monosodium glutamate, is another one. It's a big one. And um, research has shown that, um, uh, well, glutamic acid is actually an amino acid. And when you, it's found in food naturally, and it's broken down slowly during digestion. However, when it, they make MSG, it's they take the processed part of glutamic acid. And this causes a sudden surge that can actually be toxic to the brain. What's interesting about MSG is if you taste it straight, it does not have that much taste. But it actually tricks the brain to think it's something that tastes really good. Uh, it's considered an excitotoxin because it actually overexcites the neurons. It's been linked to create anger in animals and obesity because when you eat something that has MSG in it, you just crave it and you just want to keep eating it. Uh, they did an interesting study. They, they studied the, brain and, uh, the brains of animals that were exposed to MSG, and they found that MSG actually injure the part of the brain that affects learning memory and emotional development. So you definitely don't want your kids to be eating the MSG. Now, it comes under several different na names. So um, you want to watch for things that are not only have something called monosodium glutamate in it, but also things that are la labeled autolyzed things or hydrolyzed. Dr. Russell Blaylock is a neurosurgeon. He wrote an excellent book. If you want more information about it, it's called Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills. Aspartame. Let's talk about aspartame. So when they first tried to introduce it to the market, the FDA denied it eight times because they were worried that it was dangerous. But finally, it got approved, and now it's become a $1 billion industry. On the FDA's website, the side effects of aspartame include memory loss, nerve cell damage, migraines, brain lesions. I just definitely avoid anything with aspartame in it. If I had to choose between sugar and aspartame, and we're going to be talking about sugar, I would definitely choose the sugar over the aspartame. There's tons of lawsuits uh, against people that have been injured from aspartame. There's something called aspartame poisoning, where people have all kinds of nerve and health issues. So stay away from that aspartame. And let's talk about sugar a little bit. You know, when you're buying something, you don't want to have things, uh, you don't want too much sugar added to it. So check the ingredients, again, for any added sugar. If you're eating something like applesauce or fruit juice, there's just no reason to add sugar to it. Those things are sweet enough. And just to give you a visual, uh, one teaspoon of sugar is four grams of sugar. 
And if you look at something like uh, a can of Sprite, it has 38 grams of sugar, which is almost 10 teaspoons of sugar. And I, there's a commercial out now that kind of gives you a visual about the amount of sugar in the soft drinks, which I really appreciate that commercial. But uh, you want to keep that in mind. Uh, sugar's also been found to weaken the immune system. They did a study where after you eat sugar, you have less white blood cells. So it's not going to it's going to keep you from fighting uh, illnesses if you're eating too much sugar. And definitely if you are sick, you don't want to eat sugar because you want your immune system to be able to help you get better as soon as possible. There's a woman named Nancy Appleton, and she, she put together a great website. And it's um, in her website, and I have it listed here, is 141 reasons why sugar is bad for your health. I, I, I know there's a lot of uh, teachers and educators on the line, and I just want to make a special appeal to you. Um, there's plenty of um, chances. I know there's so many parties at school during the years, the birthday parties. And uh, I think if you can set the tone for your classes to the parents early on in the year that you just want parties to be healthy snacks, I think that would be huge, and it would really help out the parents that that are already feeding their kids healthy snacks. Um, I have a funny story. My son, who's now a freshman in high school, he came home right before winter break in December. And he said, oh, I want to hug you. And I said, why? And he said, because you're a nutritionist. And I, we had so many parties at school today. And I ate so much junk. And I feel terrible. And I never want to feel this way again. So um, I was really happy to hear that. And. Um, but I, I think uh, if you can support the parents in feeding the kids healthy in any way you can, that would be just a great thing to do. Some ways to avoid sugar, you know, if you're having something like cereal or yogurt, have the kind that doesn't have anything added to it. And add your own fruit to sweeten it up. There's a big difference between plain yogurt and some of the sweetened yogurt. When you're baking, a lot of times, I bake with things like squash and carrots uh, or other things, other fruit or vegetables that are sweet. If you are going to use sugar, stick with ones that are more natural, like honey. Uh, xylitol and stevia are natural sugars. They actually do not spike the blood sugar, which I'm going to be talking about. But if you're going to use sugars, use the less refined ones. Because when, they, when you see white sugar, it's been stripped of all the minerals. So at least some of these sugars like succinate and rapadura and turbinado, which you can find in the health food store, they are not stripped of all the nutrients. But still, use them sparingly. Some ideas for healthy snacks, carrots and hummus. Uh, there's a couple other thoughts here. Um, for parents, if you cut up some carrots and celery and just leave it in the fridge or some apples, your kids might just grab them if it's sitting there. Because I know a lot of times kids just want something that they can grab quickly, which tends to be the more processed food. But if you have stuff that's already sitting out for them that's healthier, maybe they'll go for that as well. One other uh, food additive I want to discuss is carrageenan. And uh, carrageenan is actually made from seaweed. Now, seaweed is healthy for you. It has a lot of great minerals in it, but the way they process this carrageenan, it actually makes it not so healthy. It's been found to promote tumors, and it's really bad for people that ha already have bowel conditions. Um, it's in a lot of things that are somewhat healthy, such as the milk alternatives. I know a lot of the almond milks have it, and some of the coconut milks. So uh, check the ingredients for that. And, and this goes with everything. If you want some of these additives taken out of the food, call the companies and let them know. Because if they think there's no problem with it, they're going to keep on making it. But if they know that it's, it's a concern for yours, then maybe they will start to take some of these additives out. And I, I, I just want to spend a minute talking about organic food. And I have to read. I know it's right there, but I have to read the uh, definition of organic. For something to be labeled organic, it must be produced without the use of sewer sludge fertilizers, most synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, genetic engineering, 
growth hormones, and antibiotics. So to me, that means if something's not organic, it can have all this stuff in it. So you really want to get as much organic produce as possible. There's a website. I have it here, foodnews.org, and it actually has a great shopper's guide to pesticides. And what they do is they rank fruits and vegetables by how much pesticides is actually in it. So they have something called their dirty dozen, which are fruits and vegetables that you always want to get organic. And then on the flip side, they have fruits and vegetables that you don't have to worry, you don't have to be as concerned about getting organic. A great thing to do is uh, try to eat local fruits and vegetables whenever possible. Go to the farmer's market, get to know the local farmers. A lot of them are using organic type farming, however, it's very expensive to get certified as organic. So uh, if you talk to them and they use the proper way to grow their food, then you can have local food, which is better for you because when things go get transported, they lose their nutritional value. And um, they're also pretty much organic. So check out the farmer's market. Another thing I'd love for people to do, I do it every spring, we plant, plant our garden, and there's nothing better than being able to go out in the backyard and pick things that you're going to use for your dinner. So uh, look into getting or growing your own garden. And just a little bit about GMOs. We're hearing more and more about that in the news lately. Uh, these genetically modified organisms are actually plants or animals that are created from merging DNA from a different species. So it's actually creating these super seeds that are resistant to insects and viruses. And this leads to higher crop yields, which means more money, but it's not without cost to us. It's been linked to things like cancer and allergies and antibiotic resistance. Um, a lot of uh, corn and soy and cotton and other a couple other uh, crops are grown almost all with GMO seeds in the United States. And a lot of countries have already, they're way ahead of the game, they've banned these GMOs. So we got to speak up and say that, uh, you know, we're not happy about this. We have to let companies know. We have to let representatives know. If it comes up for vote in your state, vote for labeling, at least, the GMOs so people know what food was grown from these GMOs. If you see that label I have here, the non-GMO project, uh, it, then uh, it's safe. You know that it's been grown without the GMOs. And there's actually, uh, at the truefoodnow.org, they have, I think they have an app that you can download to your phone that you can look at while you're shopping. And a little bit about animal products. I always tell my clients, the healthier the animal, the healthier its food is going to be. Now, natural doesn't really have any legal nutritional meaning. So when you're buying something that says all natural, that really doesn't mean much. But you want to make sure that uh, your meat or poultry is hormone and antibiotic free. And you want the animals to be eating what they are meant to eat in nature. So cows are supposed to be eating grass. That's how their bodies are set up. So if they're not eating only grass, they're not going to be as healthy as possible. And for chickens and other poultry, you want them to be out roaming and pasture fed. And the same goes for the eggs from these chickens. There, there's a good website, uh, cornucopia.org. They actually did a whole rating on uh, eggs. So you can see uh, the, health, the best kind of egg to buy. So look for local farms that, uh, to find these grass-fed animals and pasture-fed poultry. Uh, check out eatwild.com. They have a lot of good information there as well. And I know that it obviously costs more to eat organic and these healthier foods, and there's no question about it. But some things you can do is when you eat produce that's in season, it's going to be less expensive. When you go to the local farms, it's going to be less expensive. Uh, I like to suggest people to join something called a CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture. And what you're doing is you're supporting that farm. You're buying a small share of that farm. But in return, you get what they are harvesting. So you'll get like a weekly share of what they are growing. And this is a great thing to do. Maybe you want to sh um, 
share a share with a friend, and you're going to get all kinds of new vegetables and fruits and, and uh, learn about all kinds of new foods and learn how to prepare new fruits and vegetables. Uh, again, I love the idea of a home garden for you teachers. I love the idea of a school garden. And uh, just when it comes to cost, you know, you have to think about what are the long-term costs of eating these foods that might not be so good for you. Here's some information about finding local farms. Um, you know, I'm here in New Jersey, so I put a bunch of resources for all you in New Jersey. And uh, for you who are not local, you can go to, as I said, eatwild.com or localharvest.org. Those are great resources. Now, food allergies, you hear so much more about food allergies, and it's really increasing over the past uh, several years. And I listed the most common food allergies in kids. And um, in addition to food allergies, there's also food sensitivities, where kids are just not processing these foods properly, or they're causing some type of reaction in them. And these, these sensitivities or food allergies can actually present itself in a different way than the typical allergies. So as opposed to runny nose or sneezing, uh, you can see things like red earlobes, puffiness, circles under the eyes, uh, throat clearing. Um, you know, I've definitely seen um, with kids with Tourette's, sometimes they are reacting poorly to food. Uh, I was speaking with one father whose son did not do well with uh, eggs and dairy. And when he took him off, his son off the eggs and dairy, he did much better, and his ticks actually went away. But when uh, he tried to bring the food back in, the ticks started to come back. So it's definitely something to investigate to see if uh, your child has a food allergy or sensitivity. Other signs are just a sudden hyperactivity or change in behavior. Uh, another story about my son, when he was about three years old, he started getting ear infections. And I had heard about ear infections and a, co and a, a connection with po possible dairy allergies, so I took the milk out of his diet. I wasn't super strict with it, but uh, I wasn't giving him a lot of milk. And um, the, the ear infections pretty much went away, and he was fine for a couple years. And then when he went to school, he was in, I think it was first grade, and there was a week when he was coming home and he was a different child. He was, he's a very calm child, but he was hyperactive, he was acting silly, he just wasn't himself, and I was like worried what was going on. Then over the weekend, he was up in the middle of the night telling me his ears hurt. And it was funny because I looked in his backpack and there was a note from the school saying that I owed however much money because he had been buying milk all week. So to me, that was a clear sign that he does not do well with dairy. And he's still dairy-free for the most part today. Um, and uh, it was funny because he said, how did you know? Uh, he thought he was getting away with uh, buying the milk. He was trying to be sneaky. <laughs> a great book. Uh, there's a woman, her name's Dr. Doris Raff, and she wrote a book called Is This Your Child? And she talks a lot about these food allergies in children. So I definitely recommend uh, reading that book. And I, I've talked a lot about sugar, but um, you know, with the standard American diet, they're eating a lot of processed carbohydrates that are really elevating blood sugar. So what's happening is when kids eat these foods that are they're called higher glycemic, they raise the blood sugar, insulin comes in and clears that sugar out of the bloodstream. So that initial sugar rush is followed by a sugar crash. And a lot of times when they have the sugar crash, kids can have a lot of behavior issues. Uh, they're just not feeling good. They're miserable. And I see this a lot at amusement parks. Kids are just have these meltdowns at amusement parks. And, uh, you know, definitely they can be tired from the day, but a lot of it, I think, is affected is from uh, what they were eating that day. Now, I said before that in the 80s and 90s, you know, the big thing was the low-fat diet. And uh, I think it was actually not a good thing because fat is really good, especially healthy fat. 60% of the brain and nervous system is made up of fat, and we need fat to absorb several vitamins. 
you know, fat insulates our organs. It helps stable blood sugar. Some healthy fats that you want to bring into your diet are things like avocados, nuts and seeds, fish oil. Fish oil is a big one. There's been so many studies to how um, that fish oil helps with attention and hyperactivity and other things associated with things like ADHD. Another great fat is coconut oil. I'm a huge fan of coconut oil and uh, olive oil also. And I, I just want to give you a couple superfoods. I mentioned coconut. Coconut's great. It has a good amount of fat. It actually has something called lauric acid in it, which is antiviral. Um, it, help, it digests more easily than other fats because it's a shorter chain. So it actually provides the body with uh, instant energy. And you can put it on food. You can use the coconut oil for baking. And uh, coconut water is also good. We're hearing it more and more in the stores. It's uh, a lot more available now. But coconut water is great. It has electrolytes in it and a lot of natural minerals. So that's one to add to the diet. Pumpkins, both the seeds and the flesh of pumpkins are great for you. The, uh, the flesh has antioxidants and a lot of vitamins and minerals. The seeds are really good, too, because they're high in zinc um, and protein. And some ways that you can add it to your diet, I have a, uh, a little coffee grinder that I'll put my seeds into, and then you can sprinkle the, the powder onto things like cereal or add it to baked goods. And also herbs. Add those herbs when you're cooking. There's a lot of nutrients in herbs. Um, something like cilantro, which is an herb that they use a lot in Mexican cooking. It actually helps get rid of heavy metals in the body. Uh, turmeric can help prevent cancer and Alzheimer's. I've been reading a lot about how India has a lower rate of Alzheimer's, which is incredible because they eat so much of this turmeric. So just get used to adding some of these herbs. to. That you can put them in soups, sauces, or put them on chicken. And one other really important thing I want to mention is the home environment. And, um, you know, I call it nutrition for your body, uh, nutrition for your home. And there's so many toxins that we're exposed to on a daily basis. But what, and you don't have much control over that, but you do have control over your home environment. So on my uh, blog, you can check it out there. It's called the Healthy Home Course. And uh, it's an online program where you can learn all about the uh, nutrition for your home. So just in summarizing, you know, I work with a lot of people who uh, kids have several different issues. And really what you want to do is remove the junk from their diet. Uh, an important thing is to look for food allergies and sensitivities. You know, a lot of the kids that come to me Parents tell me, oh, I can tell you what they're eating. They're eating three things, and that's really common. And a lot of times it's because these kids just do not feel well. Some of these food allergies and sensitivities can cause inc increased mucus in, the, in their throat, and then they just don't feel good when they eat. And we find that when they change their diets, they're willing to eat a lot more different foods. Get those good, healthy fats into their, into their diet. Um, Check for other nutritional deficiencies and uh, control toxins in the home. Uh, on, again, on my blog, I have a series. It's a free online series, and it's called Health It Up. And what I'm doing is I'm interviewing several different uh, health experts and just so I can get the word out there about a lot of different um, issues and things that can help uh, children and adults. So check that out. Sign up for it. Um, putting a new interview up about once a week. And check out my website, too. I have some more information on there. And don't, don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions. Uh, I really just want to help you and uh, you know, do what I can to improve your nutrition. So I think that's it. I, I guess um, people might have some questions that I can answer. Oh, yes. Are we ready for Q&A? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to start off with something that just got posted a couple short time ago, but I think it's a really good question. You apparently said something about olive oil, and the question is, why not cooked? 
I guess you oh. mentioned. Yeah, you that's know? a great question. Yeah, um, olive oil is super healthy for you. But what happens is it's not one of those oils that does so well on heat. It actually changes the makeup of it on heat. So what I do is I recommend to um, use oils that do better um, when heated. And some of those are coconut oil, grapeseed oil. Some of the nut oils are OK when heated. But yeah, olive oil, it actually, uh, you're changing the makeup of it. And it's not as healthy when it's cooked. Hmm. So it kind of breaks down then when you cook it. and Exactly, yeah. OK. All right, um, given that we are the Tourette organization, we do have a few questions that are kind of triggering on Tourette. So I'm going to touch on a couple of those. Okay. And do you have any impressions or comments you'd like to make about foods that you think possibly uh, would trigger ticks in a kid, such as any of the colored dyes or anything like that, any experience in that area? Yeah, absolutely. The colored dyes, uh, like I said, those food additives, um, you know, the body just, it's like a toxin to the body. So anytime you're taking in a toxin, it can aggravate any issue that you might have. Um, an important thing uh, is the food allergies and sensitivities. You just never know when, how it's going to present itself. And I was talking about that one boy who uh, his ticks got worse when he ate uh, dairy and eggs, I believe. Um, MSG is another one that can definitely, you know, it's an excitotoxin. It's actually exciting the brain. So you want to avoid that one as well. OK. Um, would you expand a little more on what role blood sugar plays in all of this? Yeah, well, like I said, um, what happens is when you eat something that is higher glycemic, which means it spikes your blood sugar more, more insulin is going to come in, and then the blood sugar will drop. So you're having these highs and lows of blood sugar. And um, one thing that does is it really stresses the adrenal glands. And um, the adrenal glands are uh, they're, they're responsible for, I don't know if you've heard of that fight or flight reaction. Yes. But, yep. um, yeah, a lot of people liken it with uh, being chased by a bear. You know, if you're being chased by a bear, you want to have the energy or the ability to run away from it. However, we don't want to feel that way all the time. So when you are constantly spiking the blood sugar and the blood sugar is dropping, you're really putting stress on the adrenal glands. And you're putting yourself or your child in more of this fight or flight type mode. OK, good, good, good answer. Um, all right, what is the single most important thing I could do for a child from a dietary perspective today to help her with her TS? Um, well, one thing you could do, and again, it goes back to what I said about eating real food. That's number one. But another thing you might want to do is do like a food diary. And uh, keep a food diary for, say, five days or so about what she's eating. Mm -hmm. And then take a look at how she's responding to that. You know, if you notice it worse on a couple days, maybe it's related to something she's eating and you can change her diet around. Um, another thing that I do a lot with my clients is I'll put them on a, like an elimination diet so we can really isolate what foods might be bothering someone. So how long would you have to isolate a food to do that? Just talk about that a little bit. Um, you mean for an elimination diet? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would do it for three weeks to a month. Wow, OK. Yeah. And you know, there's, it sounds pretty challenging, but I, I have so many different um, recipes and things that I can support parents with. Um, there's so much food out there that you don't realize. <laughs> And uh, I'm pretty creative with some recipes, and I do a lot of research on recipes. So um, it's not as hard as it seems. And if you see an improvement, it makes it all that much easier. Mm. Well, I think that's the important thing. I think you need to get buy-in from the kid. So you want right. to do something that where there's instant gratification. Otherwise, they're going to think it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, is there something that is pretty common that you could say you could jump start with that might make a difference? You mean taking out? Yeah. 
Is there, is there a big culprit in the mix? Yeah, well, I think the dairy and, uh, you know, I would go for the dairy first. Okay. That tends to be a big one. However, you know, sometimes you try taking out the dairy, you don't see a change. So you put the dairy back in, you take the gluten out, and you don't see a change. Sometimes you need the combination of taking them out at the same time. Ah, uh, okay. So it can be kind of tricky to get the kid to participate in that, I would think. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there's so many, it, uh, and, you know, I, I've been gluten-free for uh, 15 years, and uh, 15 years ago there wasn't much out there, but there's so much more out there now, so it is easier than it used to be, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, are there um, any proven diets that help with OCD in particular, and then by way of that some tick reduction? Um, proven? No, there's been really a lot of research on uh, the gluten-free, casein-free diet. Um, you know, it, it is somewhat controversial, but uh, I'll tell you that when it works, it's amazing. Um, but nothing specific you could point to then, okay. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, the blood sugar and taking, a, um, you know, with kids with gastrointestinal issues, I've seen great things. I think on... Um, the question somebody was mentioning the GAPS diet, which is another great book I would highly recommend by uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. It's called The Gut and Psychology Syndrome. Oh, I, good, because I have a question about that too. So talk about that a little bit. <laughs> okay. You, do you want to ask the question first? Um, well, to... the question was to talk about that gut and psychology syndrome diet. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, she talks about how the gut, how all diseases begin in the gut, and the gut issues and the lack of good intestinal flora in the gut actually affects the way that the brain works. So mm -hmm. this diet uh, really helps to heal the gut, and then you see improvements. Uh, I actually have a client, just two weeks ago, she started, she's two boys, and she started her kids on this diet, and within two weeks, one of her sons, like, all his behaviors went away. And it's incredible. And usually, I'll, I'll be honest, it doesn't work that quickly. But uh, you know, there, I've seen some great results with that diet. Mm -hmm. do, do you think there's great results because the diet was so poor to start with, so it's immediately jump starts everything? Well, no, because this this woman actually uh, was feeding her kids really healthy, so he did not come from a, mm. a poor diet. So, but in a lot of times, that would be the case. So how does the psychology of that work then? Well, she's just saying that um, a lot of these psychological syndromes, um, she actually healed her son from autism with this diet, with this program. So um, hmm. she's, the psychology part is that a lot of these psychological issues, um, she even talks about depression being healed from these gut issues. Hmm. Um, I know we're going to get questions about the spelling and information on that doctor specifically, so when, when you start to post stuff to the website, would you just in, include that? Because I'm sure that people are going to be asking to, to get sure. a better handle on that, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about corn and corn products and whether or not you see an, any effects with OCD or ADHD there. Uh, in a little bit more detail. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Corn is a big one. Um, they've really changed the way they've grown corn over the years. Uh, they've just found new ways to grow more and more corn, and now uh, it's subsidized by the government. So mm -hmm. they're trying to find new places to put corn in. Uh, you know, now it's in gasoline. And um, I read it recently that almost a quarter of the... Um, foods in the grocery store have some form of corn in it. And uh, I definitely see that as being one problem uh, as it's linked to allergies with kids. Um, it's about 85% of the corn in this country is grown from the GMO seeds, and that's probably contributing to the problems with corn. Mm -hmm. You also have to use a lot of fertilizer with corn, too. You know, when you think about it, that all washes into the the rivers and streams and everything too. So, yeah, it snowballs definitely. Yeah. Um, 
child with TS, and, and mom has questions about food triggers. So can you, t could you, in your experience, talk a little bit about that? And it's not just TS in this case, it's, you know, some ADHD challenges. Do you see certain foods that you really um, have a, an immediate bounce in terms of ADHD specifically? Uh, yeah, I mean, those food additives are just really a huge one. And a lot of times when um, you take these food additives out and then your kids have one, it just makes it so much more obvious. Uh, I was working with a mom. She had twin girls, and she really cleaned up the diet. And then I think it was Halloween, and the kids had Skittles, and they just went off the wall. So, um, you know, when they're having these additives all the time, you might not notice it as much. But when you take it out, and then you put it back in, then you really see it. And uh, again, going back to those food sensitivities, there's just so many of them, and they're just so common today. So, uh, uh, yeah, okay. I, I see those two as links. All right. Um, I have a question um, from a school nurse. We really love school nurses here. Yay. As uh, <laughs> um, Talking about the importance of balanced breakfast, where have we heard this before? And, you know, she's looking for some recommendations that can be made for, you know, kids in a hurry in the morning before school. Like, what, what would you suggest in that area? Yeah, and, uh, I, you know, I really like kids to have protein in the morning. If you can't, um, you know, I like something like eggs if they're not sensitive to eggs or um, even leftover dinners. That's what I do with my kids a lot. I'll, I'll, my son loves Stephanie, them. you've kind of moved away again. Can you just... Oh, okay. Can you hear me okay now? A little better now, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I like protein in the morning. Um, things like eggs. You know, if, if your child likes hard-boiled eggs, you can make them and have them ready for the morning. Uh, a lot of times I will give leftover dinner for breakfast. And some of it is just changing the way we think about things a lot. You know, we have in our minds what a typical breakfast should be. And it's pretty much mostly sugary, starchy kind of pink and cake waffles. But to get away from that and eat more of a higher protein breakfast is good. Uh, really, if you're in a hurry, you can get like a high quality protein powder made from rice protein, whey protein, or uh, pea protein, and mm -hmm. uh, blend that up, and that would, that would be a great hmm. start in the morning. Uh, another great thing is chia. I don't know if you've heard of chia seeds. Uh, spell that uh, for me. Uh, C-H-I-A. Oh, like the chia pet things. Yeah, that's what everybody years says. Ago. Yeah, okay. I guess that's the same thing, yeah. <laughs> and these little seeds are really, that's another superfood. I didn't put it on my... Uh, on my board, but um, it's another superfood. It's really high in essential fatty acids. It's a protein. Um, you, there's a lot of recipes online. You can look up chia pudding. And you take these little seeds. They're like the size of sesame seeds, maybe. Mm -hmm. And when you mix them with the liquid, they kind of gel up. And uh, people are, have gotten really creative with uh, chia pudding. I make it. My son likes it. I'll put... Um, I'll mix it with some cinnamon and vanilla, and he'll eat it like a pudding. And that's another great breakfast. Okay, I think I got to look that one up. I can just picture that little furry thing growing yeah. grass, you know. <laughs> um, I don't recall that you you talked a lot about caffeine, but I do have a question about it. So could you talk a little bit about effect caffeines, whether or not they have an effect on any of the disorders we've been touching on tonight? Yeah, I, I definitely think there could be a link there. Um, I had spoken a little bit about the adrenal glands mm -hmm. and what caffeine does. It actually really stimulates the adrenal glands, so, um, uh, which is not a good thing. And um, that's where I would uh, watch the caffeine for sure. And, uh, okay, well, what about all these crazy drinks that are out there now, these five-hour energy things? They must be loaded with caffeine. Oh, they are, and they're really dangerous. And I think uh, I heard something on the news recently that they were going to pull them. I'm not sure, but um, it, it's really not a good thing. And um, it, it just, again, it overworks your adrenal glands, and when your adrenal glands get exhausted, then you have even more trouble, um, and that can 
I work with a lot of adults that have problems with their adrenal glands, and it causes them to need more caffeine and crave more sugar. Hmm. So, um, so really not a good thing. Um, we've talked a lot about foods that, um, you know, can trigger things. How about foods to minimize things? Are there foods that you put into the calming category? Uh, like, you know, that, that chamomile tea at the end of the day sort of thing. Are there ideas that you have along those lines? Uh, yeah, well, chamomile, that's a great, that's a great thing. Uh, lemon balm is uh, also very calming. Anything with magnesium in it is good. Uh, and magnesium is one of those minerals that m almost everybody is deficient in. Uh, so foods that are high in magnesium are like the nuts and the seeds. Um, again, the fat helps with calming. It just helps um, support our bodies in so many different ways. Um, so yeah, I would I would think of those. And also, um, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank. I forget what I was going to say, but <laughs> okay, that happens to us all. Don't worry about yeah. it. Um, Cereals. Had a question about cereals. Now, cereals are the pretty ordinary, you know, breakfast food. Right. Um, but I, I'm thinking that there are cereals such as, you know, the good old Quaker oats. Are there other things that you would recommend? Um, other cereals? Or are there any that you would recommend? Yeah, well, again, that wouldn't be my first choice, but if you were going to get one, um, Go for one of the more um, healthier companies like Hain, H-A-I-N, and I can put this up if you want. I can yeah, do a that list would be great. Of, uh, Go ahead. Uh, Nature's Path makes some. They just don't have any of those really bad ingredients. They still have the sugar a little bit, but um, compared to the others, it's much better. So I will put up the list of companies that have healthier type cereals. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, how about, let's see what time is it, we have time for one more question. Um, what would you recommend in terms, or any suggestions about food cravings, especially when you're craving sweet stuff? How do you handle that? Um, again, to me, and um, uh, you know, I mentioned my Health It Up uh, series, my interview series. I interviewed a doctor about the adrenal glands, and a lot of times when we're craving sugar, it's because the adrenal glands are causing this craving. Um, so I would definitely get the adrenal glands checked out. It's a really easy test. It's a saliva test, actually. Ah, um, okay. So, uh, but also other cravings, a lot of times when kids are sensitive to, to a food or allergic to a food, they crave it. And I've seen this very commonly with milk. Uh, I've had parents come to me and say, oh, my child loves milk. He'll drink five cups of milk a day or eight cups of milk a day, and they're actually really craving it. Hmm. And when we take it out of the diet, they almost go through like a withdrawal to it. So um, when you talk about cravings, it's definitely it's great to know what you or your child is craving because that might be a, a guide onto what issues you might have going on. So that you're craving then potentially a food that's really bad for you then. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I we are out of time, Stephanie. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. And those questions that didn't get answered, we will absolutely post on the website for you to respond to later. Okay, great. So, thank you so much for having me here. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining our webinar on food choices. How do they affect our performance? There is an exit survey, which we need everyone to fill out, everyone attending to fill out. The discussion board is now open and available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for additional questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to the site. Stay, um, th there will be a presentation on parenting a child with neurological issues presented doc by Dr. Stephen Tobias on March 27th. And, a follow and following 
that is a May 8th presentation by Dr. Mark Mintz. Thank you all for joining us. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Ms. Goodman, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night. <laughs>